Smileback CEO Jameson West returns to talk about SolarWinds MSP's new name, security vendor predictions, and more, plus a special guest interview with Zero Tech CEO Peter Sandiford on the future of cloud and identity management. It's Channel Pro Weekly, number 171. Close the kimono. Hello and welcome to Channel Pro Weekly, episode 171. Coincidentally, also the first regular episode of the 2021 calendar year. So welcome one and all. My name is Matt Whitlock, Technology Editor, Online Director, and your host of this fine program for you. And who are you? Well, stand in front of the mirror and I will describe you. Are you ready? So you have probably a head, maybe an arm, maybe two. Uh, if you look down, there's feet. For, there might be in shoes, but they're in feet. This is probably not very helpful though, because that kind of describes everybody. Uh, you are the VARs, the MSPs, the integrators, the IT consultants, the uh, managed security providers. You, if, you, if your title or company has a very like long acronym, you're probably in the right place. Uh, if you are a uh, sanitation inspector, you are probably aspiring for a new job and we welcome you anyway. So welcome one and all. Joining me this week and uh, pretty much every week is my uh, comrade in arms here, my co-host, uh, executive editor, Rich Freeman. Welcome, Rich. And thank you very much. Welcome to everybody. Happy 2021 to you, sir. And you too. So uh, we did do a, for those who missed it, we did do a, uh, a fantastic spectacular for our, uh, for the new year. It was a, uh, the 2021 New Year's special. Rich, what, what happened during that particular episode? Yeah, you know, it's like we're still cleaning up after the the greatest New Year's party ever, right? Because uh, that that was actually New Year's Day, and uh, yeah, we we invited uh, uh, well, actually, we invited every guest host we have had on the uh, show or had on the show with us in 2020 to come back on uh, all at once. It originally, was the thought, and we actually had uh, 22 of them, uh, if I remember right, who did, and we were kind of doing it in shifts to make it a little bit more practical. But uh, yeah, it was a big. Uh, a big uh, Channel Pro Weekly Zoom party. Yeah, the confetti is still over there on the floor. I haven't even vacuumed it up. Uh, we got party hats still everywhere, empty glasses. It was it was a fun episode. I encourage I, everyone uh, who hasn't had a chance to catch that yet to go in and check that one out. Uh, Rich, I'm excited that we are keeping the guest host train running right into the first episode of the new year. Um, uh, and we have a returning guest host, which is uh, always fun when we get one back. He describes himself as a serial entrepreneur and has been for over 20 years. He has a wealth of experience in several areas like founding and operating companies in the IT space, participating in peer groups, advising and consulting, and much more. Today, he serves as strategic coach at ConnectStrat and CEO of TimeZest and Smileback. Please welcome Jameson West. Welcome, Jameson. Thank you. Good to be here. Glad, glad to have you back. Uh, I believe we last had you on in episode 144, uh, titled The Mustache Crisis. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm glad you're back uh, with us again here at the beginning of the new year. We're going to talk about um, your, uh, some of your thoughts about the new year. But first, for those who may not be familiar with you, um, I kind of give a little bit of an overview there, but tell us all a little bit more about you and what you do. Because yeah, you do a lot, man. That's all I, I do a lot. So I, I, it's always a challenge for me to, I, I've got to figure out my own elevator pitch and try to compress this into 30 seconds. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. I will say um, I own an IT service company, a managed service provider um, in Seattle for 21 years, bought four other MSPs, sold in 2016. So I've, that was kind of my background. I've uh, been in multiple peer groups and, uh, and been around the industry speaking and and doing stuff since. Uh, today, I've got uh, really my uh, deeply participating in co-founder of two I, uh, two software companies that serve the space. Smileback's been around for about five, five years. CSAT, NPS, um, it really kind of started, uh, really created that space in the community. Nobody else was doing it. There's a couple other folks who are playing in the space now. That's That's been a tremendous joy, a lot of fun, um, and, and uh, a really a great company. Uh, great culture um, and very global in nature. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and then TimeZest, uh, a newer software venture, and not unlike Smileback, we're really starting as the only people who are doing what we do in the space. So scheduling, think Microsoft Bookings or Calendly, but for IT service providers, deep integrations to you know ConnectWise and AutoTask about a week away from AutoTask. So that'll be fun. 
Um, and, uh, and then connect strats been kind of, uh, you know, one of my primary things over the last year, I, I was doing a lot of EOS implementing and just consulting and advising for it service providers. And now we're really focused on figuring out more holistically, helping, helping it service companies think about their vision, their strategy and their execution. So all three blockers. Um, and then doing a lot of uh, one-on-one leadership coaching and really helping leadership teams move the needle. Um, we were finding like a lot of folks in the space. It's, it's been an interesting time of all these companies trying to transition and do new things in the space. And they're really looking for guidance. There's a lot of MSPs out there. And uh, without, without, you know, unless they have a real strategic or visionary mindset, they all sound very, very much the same. Um, and we're trying to really help our clients figure out like, how are they going to be unique and different in this world as it changes? Um, which is why every time I get to talk with you guys, I get, I get pretty excited because we were talking about that, what's coming, what's the future. And it all resonates so much with the vision and strategy my clients are setting. So well, that's awesome. So now when you go to an event, do you like have to register three times and wear three badges? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, it's unfortunately like, it's like, like you, it can be really difficult because sometimes am I am I there as a vendor am I there as a customer am I there as a speaker and the answer is almost always yes um and uh, which company are you this company yes and so it's it's kind of like uh yeah it's a it it can be a little tricky it's I, I and I the last time I went to a big event and spoke in person unfortunately it's been a while but I think I I I was speaking on topics for all three companies and and but the funny thing is, is in this space, if you're really doing something progressive and forward thinking, they all kind of connect, which is, which is pretty cool. It's like, how, how do we help people think forward, right? And kind of get unstuck from wherever we've been in the past. And, and that's what gets me excited. So you know, everyone who I've talked to as a CEO, they always say that being a CEO is like a 23-7 job. Uh, with usually an hour for lunch. <laughs> uh, how do you sleep? Like you're a CEO of like two companies. How does well, that work? So, you know, in right in, and um, in time zest, I've actually uh, transitioned to chairman of the board and turned over the CEO title to Jerway Todd, who is an ex ConnectWise executive um, and, and one of the co-founders of time zest. And it's, it has been, um, you know, being a fractional C-level person is really interesting. At ConnectStrat, we think about this all the time. Like when we help a leadership team that may not have, so think about what an IT services company does. Uh, a lot of them offer true, and I, I don't like putting lip service on VCIO. I don't really love the term. I think that we've whitewashed it by calling an average account manager a VCIO, but a few firms actually do this way, do this well, do it correctly. And essentially what you're doing is you're putting a fractional CIO into one of your clients. It's a, it's a fractional C-level person and they're doing it for multiple clients at the same time. And when I own my MSP, I had a fractional CFO for one day a week and a fractional chief people officer for one day a week. And ultimately I, I, I think that that's an extremely viable alternative and it helped me and my MSP bring in a level of person I could not afford an FTE $250,000 $250,000 CFO in my MSP. We were a four four million dollar company, right? I, I I couldn't afford that, but I could afford a quarter of that to get that level of of, of person in there. So um, the other thing we talk about is kind of the difference between being a visionary, a strategist versus an internal operator. And I'm definitely the prior, and I'm not the latter. Mm-hmm. So um, there's those C- and there's those two different types of CEOs, the ones that are like down in the trenches in the business, kind of integrator uh, in EOS language. Um, and I am not that. So if I were that, I couldn't do it three times over. <laughs> no way. For sure. So when you're not CEOing, what uh, what do you what else do you like to do for fun? What are your hobbies? You know, I moved to uh, to Vegas out of Seattle a few years ago, and I've had to kind of rethink hobbies uh, change because I used to like right now it's winter January and um, there's not snow on the ground in Las Vegas shocking I know in Seattle I didn't have to go far to find it you know I was, I was up snowboarding or whatever I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie um, but it's you know 2020 has been a rough year for uh, for that I haven't really gotten around and done what I love to do um, 
So frankly, my, my hobbies right now are, uh, I, I sit on the Peloton probably more than I should, but it, but I, it's, it's a good, it's a good habit for 2020. But, uh, right now it's kind of a, I'm finding, I'm finding my, uh, my hobbies are kind of focused around, uh, exercise, which is, which is good, but it's, a uh, it's, I, I'm a, I'm a very extroverted social person and I'm extremely anxious for what I'm hoping, thinking, I don't know, maybe mid 21 that we can kind of look back a little bit. I don't know when it is. What do you guys think? When are we going to be able to look back on this instead of feeling like we're in the middle of it? Yeah. I, 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 the timing you just proposed is, is kind of what I, and, and I don't know if I'm grasping onto that or, you know, sort of rationally thinking that that makes sense, but it, it, you know, based on timelines and what people are talking about with vaccines and when you've got a critical mass of people vaccinated and so it starts to feel like, gosh, wait, there's gotta be something going on by, you know, May, June, July, uh, may, maybe we're not, you know, the, the, my question is, when are we back to 3000 person events? And is that yeah. you know, further down the road? But, it, you know, but a little further. Yeah. Well, you know, I, hopefully, hopefully, Matt, you asked me about my way hobbies are uh, you know, 12 months from now and I can go back to answering in a, in a less COVID way. <laughs> you can only hope. I don't know. Yeah. Like I, I look at timelines and I say, I don't know if it, if, if we look at this, the, the one it, the timelines, everyone makes sense. But uh, to me, it's the reaction of the next virus because there's always another one. Yeah. And how we react to that will will indicate whether or not we have any new, any semblance of normal ever again. Yeah, so exactly. We will have to see on that. So, well, 2020 is over, Jameson, and uh, 2021 is here. Do you want to share a little bit of thoughts on like, are you, are you happy 2020 is over? What were your kind of good, highlights? Good, good riddance, good riddance. You know, <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I've, I've been in EO, uh, if you're a familiar entrepreneurial organization, peer group for seven, eight years. First few years I was in Seattle and I've been in it for a few years since I've been in trans, transition down here to Las Vegas. I'll be the president of the chapter down here in Las Vegas next year. And it has been 2020. It was a rough year for a lot of people, but you know, I, I, I'm, I have very, very close friends and here in Las Vegas who are in the conference industry, uh, convention industry, whose businesses have been decimated and no longer exist. Long-term standing 15 year businesses decimated. And then I've, you know, and then I, I'm in the fortunate spot and we're really in the fortunate industry where all three of my businesses have more revenue on January 1, 2021 than they did on January 1, 2020. Um, so first of all, I'm just, it's, it's hard. You kind of reflect back on 2020 and it was horrific in so many ways. And I just couldn't be more grateful that, um, I I've, I've been on the really fortunate. So I, when I gripe and complain about not being able to get out of the house and travel and do the things I love, I've always got this little grain of salt going on the other hand, <laughs> wow, I was, it was really fortunate and I just was positioned positioned, maybe strategically and intentional. Maybe it wasn't as accidental. Maybe I should give myself some credit, but really uh, in a position where every everything grew because I think we were, you know, we, we did some work to mitigate the risks of what could happen in all of those businesses. And being in SaaS and software and all this kind of, I mean, it's a good place to be. And I really, I've actually, I think there, I feel like prior to, prior to the pandemic, people were scratching and going, what's the future of the IT services industry and outsourcing MSP? And I feel like 2020 has been really, the tone has changed to like, wow, this is, we're not going anywhere. Like, like, like all of a sudden it, it kind of demonstrated the need to rely on expert external expertise. The companies don't internally know how, they didn't know how to navigate work from home and security and all these things. Like I feel like uh, the industry in general, I just I'm more bullish about it than I was going into the into the pandemic, which is interesting, because everybody was kind of you know businesses were hurt, small businesses were hurt, but coming out of this, you just feel I don't know how you guys feel. I, I I'm feeling more bullish about the industry than I did even going into it. It's interesting. Yeah, well, and I, I mean, it's a, a timely uh, topic to, to bring up because the, the cover story of our uh, February issue will be our annual State of the Channel report, um, which, and I haven't really started, right, I'm sort of researching it right now, I haven't started writing it. It's going to be unlike 
any state of the channel that I've ever written before, and, and not just because last year was such an exceptional year, but um, the the change in mood and, and attitude and climate in the industry, you know, it's, it's like I, I've got a, a set of data that was collected a year ago before the pandemic, and then we did some follow-up studies in, in April when the world was falling apart, and then we did uh, most of the research for this year's State of the Channel in uh, sort of like an October, September, uh, uh, October or August, September, October kind of uh, time frame, which feels very different from the time frame we're in right now, actually. Um, and so it just, you know, like charting the, the changes in, in mood and attitude. But I mean, you know, if, if there was if the, the overarching story, I think, um, will be that a lot of people in the channel did get hurt last year, um, but not nearly as much as we all feared would be the case. You know, it could have been a whole lot worse. And and while I'm detecting still a lot of caution and nervousness, and again, I'm talking largely about data collected last fall, so how people are feeling now might even be different. But there was still definitely some some caution at that point about what to expect. But by and large, a great deal more bullishness about about the future. I think a lot of people kind of figured out, you know what, my customers really can't do business without me. And uh, and that's, you know, one of the big things I learned last year. Yeah, no, I, I, I will be, that makes a ton of sense. It's like an earthquake, you know, it, it hit and the ground was shaking and everybody was worried and, and then the ground stabilizes and the crater didn't open up underneath you. So now that's stabilized and people are starting to realize it's, but we'll get another earthquake someday, but that one's behind it. Right. I mean, it's literally feels like that kind of, that kind of path. And I, I think you're spot on I, in the, and it's interesting to hear that the data is kind of backing it up. It's, I'm just, it's for me, it's purely anecdotal and tone and conversational, but it's highly aligned to what you just said. So, you know, I, I, I and I think people are just really anticipating and hoping for, you know, those personal connections, it's been, it's been really hard to see engagement. So I, I'm on, I'm sitting the other end where I used to be participate, you know, participate from kind of a customer perspective. Now as a vendor, we're trying to engage with people and doing it virtually and not being in person. Um, it has been interesting. Uh, people are ready to get, people are ready to re-engage. I think that's an exciting thing about this year as well. As we know that's coming, don't know when, but we know it's coming. Right. And that's, that's exciting as well. So, when I, so anytime there's a new year, people set goals or people are in, uh, inclined to set goals. Did you set any goals for yourself? What What is your 2021 going to look like? You know, um, we've set some very specific goals within each of the organizations. And it's probably, I probably do a better job of that than I do personally. Um, but uh yeah, I, but I'm happy to like tell you, uh, you know, from a software perspective for Times This and Smileback from a goal perspective, um, we are really trying to expand our reach and like the whole, like this whole thinking about like, they're both SaaS platforms. Like what is, what's the future of the IT services industry? How are people adopting current technologies and and some really fun specific goals around like, who are we gonna integrate with? How are we gonna expand? What are we gonna do? At ConnectStrat, um, we are just super excited because we've been talking to so many IT service providers who've, you know, whether they're doing EOS or they're doing StratOp or some other strategic work or they're using strategic coach to get one-on-one -on -one executive coaching, our big goal at ConnectStrat this year, and, and it's my personal, my personal goal that I'm excited about is to really have kind of be the go-to uh, place for an IT service company to holistically be able to think about how their leadership team moves forward. Um, I would say that uh, it's interesting in this COVID time, uh, I, I'm so much more wrapped up in my businesses and my thinking that my personal goals have kind of gotten, you know, I haven't, I haven't really developed them for 2020 yet, 2021 yet. I've, I've developed some good personal habits, but I wouldn't say I've set any good personal goals for this year. Well, hopefully you can uh, do a little bit of that. And, you know, um, for, for those who may have not, not have caught um, a, the previous episode, can you tell us a little bit about, like, the three companies that you are involved with about, and, like, what, what Smileback is and what it does yeah. and same thing? Yeah, happy to. 
Happy to. So yeah, I'll give you a little bit of background. So Smile Back, the first, actually, I'll give you a little bit of a backstory too, because it's interesting. Uh, the very first company I acquired is when, when I started acquiring MSPs was in 2010. And uh, the, the owner of the company is Brad Benner, a good personal friend of mine. He stayed on for about six months and he developed some cool IP to merge ConnectWise instances and do all this cool stuff. And he moved off, then he moved off to Berlin and uh, he's a true visionary, had all these great ideas. And Smileback was really his idea. And I was a minor co-founder in that company because I still had my MSP as well. Um, he had a technical co-founder. It's all, it was, you know, primarily running out of Berlin. Still, most of our people are in Berlin, um, but really created the idea of the green smiley face, yellow neutral face, red unhappy face. First people to do it in the IT services industry. Really no competition for the first two, three years that we were out in the market, kind of the go-to place to think about customer satisfaction. Uh, this has been an, it, there's now a couple other folks in the space. I think I mentioned at the beginning, but you know, integrating to more platforms now and added NPS, which is kind of the CSAT is how we talk, we call it the date and the relationship. So CSAT is the transaction. NPS is like, how happy are you with me? You know, as opposed to, you know, how did, how did, how was dinner today? Uh, we, right. It's a, it's a different thing. Uh, but it's important to understand both. Um, and it's, it's become, uh, you know, and I think strategically and talking to our clients, like, understanding customer sentiment and customer happiness and feedback is kind of become mission critical to most organizations where it really was five years ago, that wasn't mission critical to anybody, but uh, this, the tenor is changing, right? And it's a whole, it's, it's been really, really interesting. People are trying to mitigate churn, whether in that, that's true for a SaaS company or an MSP. It's like, you want to keep your clients and, uh, and, and it's, it's five times more expensive to attract a new one than it is to keep the ones and grow the ones you already have. So, so that's been a huge project, a lot of fun. Um, and it's, a, it's, we, we really enjoy that. Time Zest, um, if you're, you're familiar with Calendly, I assume, um, you know, they've exploded. I mean, they're, they're saying that's going to be kind of one of the next unicorns. Tremendous. Uh, they're, they're continue to blow up. 2020 is a good year for Calendly. Right, it, which makes a ton of sense. Um, so think of Time Zest as really being a, a very similar tool, but deeply integrated to the process for an IT service company. Because Calendly doesn't integrate to any of the PSA platforms. Microsoft Bookings, which a lot of our clients are using, Microsoft Teams and Office 365, love it. But Bookings doesn't have all these other, it doesn't talk to any other calendars, and especially not your PSA. So. Uh, so we have a deep understanding of those processes and we want to integrate to, I need to update the ticket. I need to make sure everybody's clear from an engineer and a technical perspective and a client perspective. And 2020 was just a banner year for us. It's super exciting. We, we believe that we can, you know, we're continuing to expand that process. And then thirdly, finally, um, I've already talked about a little bit, but ConnectStrat was really about talk, I, I was doing some EOS work and talking to other people who are doing EOS work. If you're not familiar, entrepreneurial operating system, the book Traction. Um, I was doing that work for some people in the industry and talking to other people who are doing that kind of work in the industry. And, and all of our clients were having, we're going, this is great. And it's really helping us execute well. And, and you're helping us think really about our vision and our core values and some really high level stuff, but we're having to go somewhere else for strategy. And my senior leaders are really like, maybe they're engineers that have grown up and we're trying to get into leadership or we're bringing in these kind of uh, junior leaders, but we need to accelerate them. So they need coaching and they need to understand how to become better leaders and better executives. Um, and maybe the entrepreneurs are going, hey, I also need to think about life planning and, and I need to graduate from my business being me to my business just being an asset of mine and thinking about my own personal goals and values. And what we did is we tied all this together and said, we think holistically we can build a company. And we, so we, we have four pillars, vision, strategy, execution, and impact. And vision, strategy, and execution are all about the business. Vision and execution are kind of EOS. Strategy comes from some other pieces. And then impact is the life and legacy of the entrepreneur or the leadership team. And then we, across all of those, we provide one-on-one -on -one leadership coaching. And so our dream is to just, you know, 
like I said, we have about six strategic coaches globally. Our newest is in Perth, Australia. Um, and, and, and 2020 has been huge for us because we've had to engage in these deep, long strategy meetings and sessions virtually. So we're doing, and, and that's hard to do eight or nine hours and, or maybe even two days in a row on a zoom session, but we figured out how to do it very interactively. And so now we're being, we're now we're delivering those services to more MSPs globally because we've figured out how to do that in a way that eradicates or at least diminishes zoom fatigue, which is a, which is a, became a very real thing this year. Right. And people get and people are working around it. So long answer to your, to your question, but um, we're doing some good stuff and I'm really excited about it. Hey, you know, I want to, I want to really, really quickly ask a question because we've got to move on to the news uh, here in a, a moment now, but it, what you just said there touches on something that I've been kind of thinking about and talking to people about a little bit. So right now you have to do those big eight hour, maybe two day meetings with your clients online. But as we were discussing before, we're whatever, six, nine months, you know, we're some period of time away from when you can do it in person again. But the fact that you've been doing it virtually allows you to, you know, maybe expand your, your market and your reach. Do you see yourself going back to the way you did business before? Great question. And I think everybody's asking these questions in every type of business. And I, I, my answer is no, I don't see us going back to doing it the way we did before. Uh, we have taken all of 2020 and we have moved our IP for how we deliver these. And we are so much more efficient and we can do so, we can drive so much more value and so much less time and cost through virtual sessions. Now, do I believe that we will never meet our, our clients in person? No, I, we have clients, but we won't go all the way back. We'll, we'll take a micro step back. Um, I have a client who's like, hey, let's do our annual Let's get, because we, we encourage people to get out of their heads and out of their workspace. So they're, they're, they're not getting appointments and people and get out, right? When we do strategy sessions for a day, I encourage right now our clients to like, stay home. Don't go to the office. Even if your offices are open, find a place that's private and where you're disconnected, except for connected to me. And we're going to do this or, or whatever coach they're working with. Um, and, but, but my clients are still inclined to, Maybe at their two-day annual, say, I have a client right now who's like, hey, let's all go, including me to Maui, <laughs> and we'll do two days in person. But it, the rigor and the cadence that we're trying to bring with this just is no longer about being in person. Like if, if we need to do a half-day strategy session, we need to be able to do that tomorrow. And I, I'm not going to fly to Chicago to get that done. Like, let's, let's get it done. And we've driven so much IP. And we don't share screens or anything. We're looking at each other in Zoom. And it's actually, there's some things about it that are pretty unique. I can be in a room with five people, but I can't see every micro expression like I can with both of you right now. If they're sitting around a table, I may not catch things. And then I have another monitor that we have. We use a platform called Mural, but it's like a virtual whiteboard that the stickies don't fall off of. Right. And so we're all interacting. I'm not just showing a PowerPoint deck. I'm not sharing a screen. And we've really created a cadence and a system that that uh, does not feel the same as sitting in a Zoom meeting, getting a presentation for eight hours, because that that's death to everybody. Right. So that didn't that doesn't work. And so if if they are normally work, if they normally work from their home office, do you tell them to like leave their house or do you tell them to like no. just take the meeting from the bathroom or something? Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. I need to get you out of your workspace. So you need to go sit in the living room. I don't know about bathroom. I don't know about bathroom. But you, sit, you know, you might have one of those jacuzzi tubs, you know, they can sit. That there. works. That works. I, am I allowed to do that? I don't know. <laughs> I guess it depends on how, how well you know them. How comfortable uh, are we? <laughs> good. we? Open and honest is like a, like the main thing. It's like you gotta get you gotta you know open the kimono, but it was never really meant literally. So, <laughs> yeah, tell your customer to uh, to take a to open their kimono and take a dip in the tub. I don't know if that's gonna help help no. this business. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. All right. Well, on that note, I think we're going to move on to uh, to news. So, Rich, we don't have a lot of news because the year's just kind of started and everybody's kind of getting getting their things rolling. So there's a, a little bit of news. One that I think I think we guessed that this was going to happen a couple weeks ago. 
um, or you know, or last month or whatever, one of our last shows. And then we've got uh, some uh, security vendor predictions we're going to go into. A couple quick mentions. And uh, I know Jameson's going to share a museum pick with us later. Oh, we also, coming up, we've got a great interview that we did with uh, Peter Sandiford, uh, the CEO of Zero Tech. That's going to come up later in the show as well. So, uh, and uh, Jameson West was with us during that interview, a big part of it. Great, great stuff. Uh, can't wait to get to that. So, Rich, let's go to our one news story for the, for the day. Drum roll, if... It, it, if we can, SolarWinds MSP has done what? <laughs> so they have not, for someone who's thinking, wait a minute, did they announce that they're definitely spinning off? No, they they have not done that. Um, uh, obviously, last year, uh, SolarWinds, which, uh, by the way, in case you haven't noticed, has been in the headlines a little bit uh, lately, um, they announced that they were thinking very seriously about taking their SolarWinds MSP business unit, uh, the part of the company with the RMM tools and, and all the MSP technologies, spinning it off as a, a separate and publicly traded uh, a company. And uh, they, they even filed some very preliminary paperwork with the SEC to, to you know, move that step a little bit further down the road. Uh, later on in the year, they are still not, you know, officially um, saying that that's going to happen. Although based on everything I have seen and heard, um, th this is coming, and it's really more of a question of uh, of when than than if. I still believe, even despite all of the the security woes uh, over at SolarWinds right now, one of the things that they announced uh, last year was that when if this happens. Um, obviously, they were going to need a new name and they were working on a new name. And uh, over the, the holiday break, when uh, we were all kind of powered down, they picked a name and they announced what that name is. And uh, everything old is new again, uh, Matt, because they are going to be named Enable. Uh, now, Enable, and we're, you know, you, you said we're, we're talking to Peter Sandiford in just a little bit. He was uh, the founder of um, Level Platforms, one of the RMM uh, pioneers. Enable was another uh, of the big pioneers in, in an RMM software. SolarWinds acquired uh, Enable at a, a certain point in 2013. Um, they later acquired a different, a different company with a cloud-based RMM tool uh, called Logic Now. And it was when they put uh, Enable and uh, Logic Now together that they created that SolarWinds MSP group. Uh, but they, you know, if, especially if they're going to be an independent business, they, they can't have SolarWinds in the name anymore. They needed a name and they went with Enable, the name that that people still know. Um, it, it It's a kind of interesting thing, though, um, isn't it, to see uh, a, Enable, you know, back in the uh, in the headlights uh, or, or uh, spotlights rather uh, that way again, that that brand. So it'll be interesting is that if in six months they change their name to Logic Now. <laughs> and then six months later, change it to GFI Max. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so not a shocker. I, and I, enables a good name. It's got a lot of goodwill. And I think the timing is great because with the Solar Winds, uh, kind of in the news in a very negative connotation right now, I think distancing themselves from that name uh, is going to be beneficial for them uh, in, in the short term and in the long term. Uh, Jameson, your thoughts on the name? Are you are you? Yeah, it's interesting. Right I, didn't, I, I did not know this news until just now. It's very interesting. My reaction is like, wow, that's kind of that's kind of interesting. Um, I was I would have uh, in. Yeah, fortunately, I think there is some goodwill behind the name. But I always wonder when you kind of go back to a product, the challenge is, is do people does it take how much education does it take to train them that it's not the old and because it, it is different now. It's not what it was then. And a lot of people who've been around the block are going to be like, oh, I looked at that product five years ago or whatever, and they're done. And it's like, oh, that's not, you know, it'll be really interesting to see if that's a challenge for them. I've always struggled with people going back to really old names, but it's not the same thing anymore. It's, it'll be a challenge. It's a, that's a very good point. Maybe they should have named it like Enable 2. Yeah. The sequels are a big deal right now, you know. <laughs> uh, are they as good as the original? <laughs> I don't know, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or the, yeah, and then if they come up with the old product again, they could call it Enable Classic. Um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I I was kind of thinking they should have gone with something new because I, I agree with you. I think people might look, but not everybody's going to know that uh, that the name has changed. Now, if you're a current customer, you'd know that the name has changed because it's going to change before your eyes. But I agree. Like for those who maybe weren't customers well now they're just gonna be like oh i already saw it. yeah I, I think you're right i already saw that it wasn't what i wanted when it could is different now rich what do you think what do you think they should have done 
Uh, you know, I mean, well, you're both making a really interesting point that I hadn't thought much about before, because the fact of the matter is that, you know, there, there have been a lot of people who have gotten into managed services since uh, the early days, uh, you know, I mean, since 2013, when, when Enable became part of SolarWinds. But a, as we all kind of famously know, the, the channel is still, you know, a little, little gray around the temples. We're not the, the, the youngest folks uh, on the on the. And so there are going to be a lot of people out there who still I mean, part of what they're trying to do, as you're, you're both saying, is slipstream on the brand recognition that comes with Enable. But the, the association people are going to have is with on-prem RMM. <laughs> And, and that, you know, I mean, that, that's really not, it's, it's not only, um, you know, much narrower in terms of what you can get from a SolarWinds MSP, but the whole on-prem piece of that uh, doesn't even represent accurately what they can do in just in the RMN category right now. So they, yeah, they'll, they'll both benefit from the, that, that uh, history and, uh, and have to fight it a little bit. So I, maybe the solution would be to title this like a Star Wars movie and have it be something like, you know, Enable logic now strikes back or something like that. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to go in a Star Trek direction and say, enable the next generation. <laughs> the next generation. <laughs> I was trying to slip another one of their older brands in there. Um, maybe, and you know what? I think we were just looking at this a little too complicated, maybe putting more thought into it than they did. They probably just looked through the current dot com domains they still have registered. And they're like, yeah, let's do that one. Because if we go get a new .com, it's going to be something like, you know, groofafootalusstoll.com because every good .com is already taken. So. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the easiest way to do it. I'll tell you, when we were when we renamed uh, Jameson West Consulting Services to Arterian many, 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 many years ago, 2011, um, it was a factor. We had a company that we hired that narrowed it down to 17 or whatever. And the first thing I did is said, what domains? And I think 15 of them were gone. <laughs> it was like, well, there you go. And just narrowed it down to two real easy or whatever. It, 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 that's a factor these days. It's how companies are named. If, if, if you can't get the dot com, you don't, you don't use it. So you have to look and see what dot coms are available. And that's why we're getting all these weird, goofy company names these days. Because all, the, <laughs> all the other ones are already, already taken and, and mopped up. So, Rich, I'm not sure there's much else to talk about on this story other than I'm. It's it's an obvious name they went back that they that they chose, and uh, for lots of reasons. But you you still still definitely think they're going to get spun off. You know, I I I do the the uh, all of the the indications so far, I, and I was wondering about. I mean, as recently as you know a few weeks ago, I was kind of wondering, well, how how does this uh, this whole security disaster that they're in the middle of potentially uh, shake that up? Um, because in some ways, you know, as far as we know right now, and um, in this uh, exact same uh, uh, press release that um, SolarWinds MSP issued in which they said, here's what our, our new name is going to be. They also said, we, we have found no evidence of compromise whatsoever from uh, Sunburst or Supernova, the two kind of big flavors of this, this attack in our RMM software. So the, the, you know, the, the one part of SolarWinds right now that is sort of least impacted by this is SolarWinds MSP. And it, do, do you really want to be, you know, parting ways with them and, and betting your future on this platform that, I mean, I, I, I don't even know what the sales pipeline for Orion looks like, you know, right now. So I was kind of wondering, does this change things? But the indications I'm picking up so far, this isn't definitive, is that the, the, the plans are still uh, full speed ahead. And and again, nothing official, but I still think it's going to happen. Yeah, well, we'll watch the news and we'll see uh, we'll see what happens. And of course, if they do that spinoff, you'll hear about it here on Channel Pro Weekly ASAP. Uh, so Rich, that's kind of it for news. There's really not much else going on this week. I think hopefully by next week, we'll have a little bit more headlines. Go. Oh, well, CES is coming up. So that'll be... We'll be talking about plenty of uh, CES related news and uh, hopefully some cool hardware news. I believe we have uh, Jeff Halosh coming on uh, in a few yeah, we do. to talk yeah, about that. There's going to be lots of hardware next uh, week. So I can tell you for sure. In fact, I, I did a story this week, which I deliberately left off the show so we can talk about it next week. But Dell has already announced their uh, commercial client uh, CES stuff. Um, and uh, I've got Lenovo coming, news coming up and Intel and we're going to have Stephanie Halford, who was on the show recently uh, from Intel, back on the show to kind of talk about some of their CE. So it's it's going to be all about hardware. Now you're you're going to be uh, a very happy guy next week. Yay! Right? That's the kind of stuff I like to talk about. Good <laughs> times. Well, that'll be that'll be fun. Uh, so we're going to move on to another story, Rich. It's uh, seven security vendor predictions 
for the upcoming year. What are the what are the security vendors predicting? That there's going to be threats? I think that's a pretty obvious prediction. Yeah, weren't, weren't we all hoping that uh, the, the prediction was uh, no more security problems, right? Hey, folks, we got this licked. Uh, all they had to do was stop making hoodies, Rich. We talked about this. We can get rid of every security and hacker problem if we just stop making those zip-up hoodies. Then there would be no more hackers. Right. Yeah, that, that was a show title, I believe. Uh, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. So what are uh, they, what are we what are we predicting here? You want let's pick like two or three of them, and then we'll uh, we'll send everyone to the site to read the rest. Yeah. Okay. Well, so and I'll skip over. You know, like the the first one. Um. Uh. And it, although this did sort of grab my attention, I, it, it's not a, a shock that we're looking at more ransomware this year. But uh, the CEO recently uh, named CEO of Centrify is expecting ransomware incidents to triple in 2021. <laughs> Uh, and we could have a whole conversation about that, and uh, we probably don't have time to do it. But, you know, but I mean, what what the hell is wrong with the industry? If, if after all the millions and millions we've already spent, ransomware is going to triple in 2021. But let's let's move on maybe to some other uh, other things here. Um, I uh, got some predictions from uh, Corey Nockreiner, who is the CTO at WatchGuard. He always has interesting predictions for the year ahead, uh, and he sees, and this this could be a real problem. He sees spear phishing. Um, becoming more of an automated attack. There's a lot of spear phishing going on right now, but it tends to be kind of um, a, a manual effort for the attackers. They have to kind of learn about who uh, the target is. And um, he sees a whole generation of uh, uh, sort of black market tools coming around that are going to enable them to do spear phishing on, on more of an automated mass kind of basis. And so therefore he thinks you're going to see uh, a lot of it. Um, Interestingly enough, and I should say, just as context for all of this, it, it, this is like a, 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 an annual rite of passage for me. This is on the calendar every year. Every year, right around November, I start getting inundated um, with predictions from for the new year from vendors, and a lot of them are about security. And a lot of those predictions from multiple companies um, this year uh, touched on the issue of deep fakes, which is a, a technology that you know we're all kind of familiar with, we're hearing about, but it, it, it sounds like, uh, and I don't know if this is the right word, but it sounds like 2021 might be kind of a, a breakthrough year for these um, artificially generated videos that are very, very convincing. Um, and a lot of that will be used uh, you know, for prank purposes and, and all the stuff that you would anticipate, but there are some uh, you know, commercially oriented uh, security applications uh, of that technology that we could start seeing. Um, and, I, and nobody in the predictions I got uh, mentioned this, but I, I remember you know, just reading about it, thinking to myself, man alive, what could you do around a you know, business email compromise attacks with a really good deep fake? But we'll, we'll see when that kind of uh, starts to come along. Um, uh, gosh, let's see. Well, you know, no, again, no, no giant surprise. Um, but uh, more work from home related security threats. Uh, people are going to continue working uh, from home for quite a while this year and to some extent uh, probably on a, on a more or less permanent ongoing um, basis. And uh, uh, Corey at, uh, uh, at WatchGuard um, already sees attackers kind of moving laterally across home networks. Um, uh, and and looking for weak points that can help them compromise, uh, you know, a corporate resource, and uh, that's something that he's very concerned about in 2021. And in fact, he sees them, he sees attackers getting more and more skilled at sort of sniffing out the devices in a in a home that do um, act like like the, you know they, they can tell which devices are utilizing VPN, for example, and that's the thing that they're going to zero in on. So you're going to see not only more work from home attacks, but smarter ones. Uh, and then we've and we've spoken about this before, and we spoke about it in the last episode, uh, uh, our big party episode last week. Um, but a lot of predictions uh, about more regulation um, coming to uh, to the industry next year, and specifically in the realm of security and uh, the aforementioned solar wares, uh, solar winds, excuse me, um, disaster is, is a, you know, I think we can all predict going to play some role in getting a little more regulatory attention paid uh, to security risks. You know what? This is always a depressing one to to read every year, Rich. Like, because it's <laughs> never that. good, right? It's, yeah. it's never. Less, I I always go to the next slide, thinking like, you know, and there's gonna be less viruses, and you know, bunnies are gonna come out and romp around everywhere. It's it's always doom and gloom. And the sad thing is, 
it's usually always right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Jameson, I mean, we touched on a couple of those predictions. I mean, do you think any of those are off? No, I don't. And I don't know if you guys uh, predicted the pandemic last year. I mean, it can be more, it could be, it could be worse, but uh, so, you know, no, I don't think uh, it does it. Yeah. It, I actually, I, I, I spent most of the time Rich was talking, thinking about the deep fakes. I was like, whoa, that's, this could be like, you think about nefarious uses for, yep. you know, AI and technology and that could be creepy real quick. Like deep fakes is a big deal folks. And I, if I was going to make a prediction, um, there is going to be a massive effort into deep fake detection um, and to detect videos that are, that are fake, but they, they, ha the, that has the potential because we are always used to being able to believe what we see. Yeah. And yeah. once deep fakes get good enough that that is no longer true, it is chaos. That is, I don't know how to deal with that. And the, the thing that uh, I, in, in the article that uh, we're sort of alluding to, I quoted a, uh, an executive from a, a vendor called iProve, which, and they're kind of in, as the name suggests, they're kind of in that zone. But the thing that he emphasized was that um, part of the reason why you're going to see a lot more of that this year is because the technology required to do it has gotten a lot less sophisticated. You don't have to be a Hollywood movie studio or whatever to, to kind of, you know, it, it's, it's getting easy enough um, that people who are not, uh, you know, don't have a ton of, uh, of, of money and, and giant computers at their disposal can do it. And so, yeah, that, uh, that is a scary uh, topic. Not fun. Any other? So you think uh, uh, James and ran ransomware will triple? No, I can't buy. I can't believe that. No, you don't think so? it'll still be bad or be worse, maybe. But how could how's triple even possible? Yeah, yeah. Like I can't. I can't. I, we'll see. I could be wrong, but that just doesn't. I'm, I'm with Rich on that. That's, it, that's really a lot. Like, that's a big. That's a big jump. That's a big jump. It's bad right now. It's bad. And 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 I would think that more and the. the I would think the acceleration of the protections around ransomware feels like they're ramping up significantly. The awareness is higher. I, I would, I, maybe they'll triple the attempts, but I can't believe actual ransomware where would, would triple. It just doesn't seem viable to me. I don't know. Yeah. And, and the last one, which I think you mentioned was the work from home. So more work from home threats. I, James said, I want to, I would also like your take on that too, because it, it does seem like the work from home, phenomenon is not going to go away now there may as as things change and if you know we do get so, back to some you know, even, though, even when people start going back i mean first of all like, like, thank goodness i'm not overly invested in the commercial real estate market right i mean they're, yeah, no kidding. we're not going even people are going back and not going all the way back my companies all of them even if they're even my clients are like hey we're still people have gotten pretty productive in certain roles super productive because they're in their home environment so they're even if they're coming back, they're not coming back 40 hours, right? And so there's that you, which actually is doubly difficult for the MSP because now I've got to support every person in two environments all the time, right? So it's not just work from home it's or office, it's yes and yes. Um, and that's, that's complicated. And it, it kind of goes to this whole conversation of like, so what endpoint are they using? How am I going to protect them? What are they, you know, it's, it's this going to tease up this conversation that we had uh, with Peter that everybody's going to see um, is, is like, we've got to be thinking about, I will tell you um, my clients from a connect strat perspective, it is a strategic endeavor to start thinking about like, how do we, how, how do we productize or think about work from home solutions that, that make people feel safe and productive? Yeah. I, I, it, your thought, how much does the MSP, how deep do they go into like the, the work from home space do you do, is it all about endpoint protection or do you think they like they start working on no i i think the problem network? is i think you're gonna have two types of providers you're gonna have the providers who are in a traditional sense are like wait we protect all the computers how are we going to protect the home computer and they're thinking of it from an endpoint perspective instead of saying no my real problem which was there before they were working from home because in realistic realistically they were doing some work from home and from their mobile phone and from their cousin's house over Christmas or whatever. Um, the problem isn't the endpoints. The problem is, is like, where's our stuff and how are we protecting them getting 
to it from anywhere. So the really progressive spot on MSPs work from home was not a challenge. They were in cloud and managing this and it didn't matter where people connected from or how, they were protected. And this is stuff I've been talking about from years. If they were doing this right, this was a kind of a non-issue. But all of a sudden this has been a year of really for me, uh, this is stuff I thought was going to happen before 2020, and, it, and this was kind of the catalyst for, you saw project revenue stop in March and April, no project revenue. When project revenue came back, where did it go? Right to where it probably should have been going for the three years prior. Like, let's figure out cloud and migrations and Office 3, get, you know, let's, we've got we've to remotely enable people. Um, so I think you're going to have two trains of thought and the people who are doing it right. It's less about the endpoint than it is about this is ubiquitous. It's not just their home office. It's everywhere. Yeah, for sure. Well, Rich, there's, there's a bunch of other, um, predictions in here. Uh, we'll let everybody go to the show sheet for episode 171 and, uh, they can follow the link there and go and read all of the rest of the predictions, which, um, who knows? Some like we, we we made a joke, Jameson, last uh, last week on the the New Year's special that had we made had we gone back and done like a let's predict what's going to happen in twenty twenty uh, at the start of the year, like we would have been wrong about everything. <laughs> so, um, but these are security predictions. Some of them are probably pretty good. Some might be a little off, but I guess we'll find out at the end of the year whether we were right. Um, and what you were talking about there, Jameson, is a great lead into our interview that we're going to have here with Peter Sandiford in a minute. Uh, so keep that in mind, folks. But uh, the next, we got a couple of quick mentions, Rich, that I want to go through real quick. Um, so we've got a blog entry about what a special webinar. What is this all, all about, Rich? Uh, yeah, so two very, very quick things, and you can get more details by going to the, uh, the uh, show notes and, and looking this up. But first of all, I just wanted to point out, because um, we talked about this on the podcast late last year, that uh, late in the year, the IRS uh, announced some, uh, some uh, regulations around the taxability of uh, PPP loans that took a lot of people by surprise. Channel Pro did a webinar on that with Rianne Buccianico to kind of explain the implications. While we were all kind of enjoying the holidays, another COVID-19 relief uh, act was passed by Congress, completely changed the entire landscape um, just in the last few weeks. And so next Tuesday, um, 11 a.m. Pacific time, 2 p.m. Eastern time, I will be participating in a webinar. This is not actually a Channel Pro webinar. It's hosted by our, our good friend, Carl Palachuk. Um, I'm a, a guest, so is Ryan. And really, this will just be uh, Carl and me asking Ryan questions because neither of us knows anything and she knows a lot. Um, but it's live. If you have questions about any of any of this, the new um, COVID-19 Relief Act, the new PPP money that's coming, the tax questions are out, any of that, um, go to the show notes, look up the link, get registered. That's coming next Tuesday. And then the other thing I'll, I'll quickly point out is um, in, uh, I believe it's our March issue, uh, we'll be doing our annual Vendors on the Vanguard story, which is where we highlight uh, vendors out there, companies like, say, Smileback and, and TimeZest, uh, who you uh, uh, haven't heard of before, but probably should have heard of before. And every year we, we run a survey. We ask people to suggest names that we might want to include in that article. I always learn about some some interesting new companies that way. That survey is live now, uh, and we are we are soliciting that that input from uh, ChannelPortNetwork.com. So if you have thoughts on sort of un, uh, unsung, underappreciated, up and coming vendors that who we should uh, highlight. Uh, take a look for that on uh, channelpornetwork.com. Awesome stuff. Check that out, folks. Um, and with that, we are going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to uh, be joined by Peter Sandiford, um, the CEO of Zero Tech, who is going to go through, uh, well, it's a, it's a fascinating discussion all, all, that really hinges on identity management. You're, you're not going to miss it. Great stuff. Stick around for that. We will be right back. And welcome back to part two of Channel Pro Weekly. We've got an excellent interview lined up for you today. We're excited. We've uh, alluded to this one uh, in the past, uh, and we are excited that we finally got him here. He has, uh, he has a passion and a proven track record for taking breakthrough technology innovations from concept through to major business success for decades. In 2003, he founded Level Platforms, which grew to be a leading provider of SaaS RMM software. Today, he serves as founder and CEO of Zero Tech. Please welcome Peter Sandiford. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Great to be here. Glad to have you on. Uh, we, we've been kind of building this uh, interview up here for the last couple of shows, so we're excited to have you here. But um, 
other than the, the kind of brief uh, outline I, I kind of did there, although we could just leave it that and just end the show and the interview saying, oh, we know everything about you now. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about you and uh, about how you got to where you are now and a lot of the companies that have that you've started and, and ran along the way? Well, I've always liked the early stages of businesses. Like that to me is to find where you've got a problem and you know there's a solution out there, but you, nobody knows exactly what it is. So going into a market where there are already competitors is something that has never been fun for me. But so the idea of creating something brand new that solves a problem is always there. So that's where Level Platforms was. We started out in 2003 and, and we'd never heard of Kaseya or Enable or those any of those guys. We were just building our thing. And then we came across them, you know, in the course of, uh, you know, how do you guys compare to these guys? And by the way, Enable was in Ottawa, just as we were. We had no idea they were going to be our, and were for a decade, our, our top competitor worldwide. And, and in fact, my last office, I looked out and waved over to the Enable office, you know, across the, across the field. So, so there we were, we were pretty much uh, starting this off and we all did pretty well in that period. It was a lot of fun. And uh, but in 2013, all three of us were acquired uh, within a couple of months. It was quite amazing and quite a game could just quite, it just happened by chance. But I think maybe not by chance because from my perspective, it was, uh, the, there really was a, a, a problem in that, you know, in my mind, on-premise computing was finished and RMM was dead, certainly commoditized and had no future at all. The fact that it's still growing is to me amazing, but, but it's amazing not in a way that I regret. It's just, okay, good. These guys are having fun, you know, taking this through the rest of the, the product life cycle, but I'm on to the next thing. And that, that was, and then that was the, the, the foundation of, of, um, the foundation of zero tech because we started off saying okay well let's where is everything going well not one dollar of software of money is being invested in software companies these days except for SaaS. no one's building on-premise software for anything so just extend that out in your mind and then how our msp is going to be managing applications it's going to be SaaS, and where are those going to live no you know they're going to be out in the out in the cloud and and what devices are they going to use? Well, they're going to be disposable consumer devices because they're getting everything on the cloud. So what is an MSP going to do? So we spent a lot of time. We actually had a group of people, uh, former MSPs and others, and we met actually monthly, just slowly thinking. I, I had the task of thinking about what is the next big thing. And uh, and so we, we, uh, we tried a lot of things and did some pivots and kind of figured this out. But what was really interesting is, that, is we really went through the, what is the life of a day in an MSP going to be like in 2025? Mm -hmm. That's where we started our, our plan. What are they going to do? What's that world going to look like? And what we came back to was that the core thing, and this is where, where I know James has been really interested in, is, that, is we came back to the core requirement that identity management, uh, which no one has had or still has, uh, was the core of this and that being able to onboard, offboard, know which, which, which uh, users were using which assets, how, when, who had rights to them and who, you know, how, how all that was being controlled so that uh, with, with, when everything's sprawling, when users are all over, the, all over the world and the applications are running on servers all over the world. And uh, you know, the, so you know, the perimeter is gone completely. Uh, if it, you know, so the idea of VPNing back in behind, you know, behind the firewalls just doesn't make any sense. So you need a whole new, you know, whole new approach to this, and that's uh, that was the foundation of this. So we we started uh, looking at okay, SaaS management, and that's still what we're trying to do. We're building SaaS management, but we're building it from the ground up, and the ground up starts with identity because you know, I've talked to lots of MSPs; they don't want SaaS management. They don't care, like saving money on renewals and stuff like this, it's not an interesting to them. What is interesting to them is the security problem and the productivity problem, the multi-authentications that are going on now are driving people crazy and the, and the security of, uh, of uh, a risk of ransomware and the password chaos, the authentication chaos, like it's, it's madness. And, uh, and it's, so it's kind of evolving very much, you know, to where everybody really needs what we've got. Uh, so I'm pretty excited that we're 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 on right now. We're going, we're signing up MSPs every week. So we're with with no marketing at all. So it's really uh, it's really you know it's really growing. It's really growing quickly now, and people are really really enjoying it. 
So, I mean, you, you kind of touched on um, aspects of it uh, right there, but I mean, t talk a little bit more about what it is about the, and what's called the, the legacy generation of tools that MSPs use, but what makes them inadequate essentially to deal with, and not even just the IAM issue, which is the one that you've really kind of zeroed in in, uh, in on, but just cloud management in, in general. What, what's the delta between the tools that MSPs rely on today and what they really need to take care of their customers' cloud needs? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, the, because the tools are, are all designed to manage on-premise technology. So RMM is all about looking at what devices are being used who cares you know really who, who really cares about what devices you're using and and the and the software is all in the cloud so office 365 it doesn't really matter you know managing an exchange server that's not a, that's nothing to be done there you know so so what's going to happen what you know so so how are they how are they going to manage those things now one view is that well it goes in the cloud well there's nothing to do for us whoa that's not the problem that's not it at all there's to, you know, when it's like all technology, you solve one problem and uh, that in you know, all the things you used to do to solve that problem are gone. And sure enough, wow, you know, it, it wasn't that easy. So now SaaS is easy, right? Hey, you just sign up, pay monthly, don't have to worry about anything. Okay, so what is the problem? Well, the problem is, well, you've got uh, all these applications with their own authentication. Uh, you've got passwords for all these applications. You've got people coming and going and now you've got 15, 20, 30 SaaS applications, but certainly the big ones, uh, which are very important, have the, you know, have got the, you know, the company's jewels are all there, right? So, so, you know, now you've got, now you've got uh, 20 or 30 different passwords, different ways to authenticate, different applications to use, to train, to monitor how they're being used, to secure, so when somebody leaves, you know, are, are they still able to access that application? I will bet you that every organization in every SMB has applications that, that when employee leaves, the employee still has still has rights to get into those applications. So you can't, you got to stop all that, right? And you, you can't stop that with any of the any of the on-premise tools. This is all this is all cloud stuff. This is all monitoring those applications, finding out you know what's going on, keeping track of them, onboarding, offboarding, provisioning. You know, tracking tracking policies, that's the biggest one. You know, policies will shift around. Somebody will have rights to doing something. Someone will go in and change the policy. And and now somebody has a different a different different rights than we're, we're expected. And now you have the security breach. Uh, and so, uh, you know, maintaining all of this is a big, big problem. And it's not kid stuff. We started working with, um, you know, with Azure AD, obviously, Microsoft's everywhere. And... Uh, and you know it's 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 you know building its integration with Azure and all of those kinds of you know, with uh, with with, with uh, uh, AD I should say, uh, and you know they they have a fantastic product, but it, you know it's not really built for MSPs and it's a lot of and, and it's like, like Microsoft they're scrambling everywhere to do a lot of things for a lot of people, so uh, so we ended up with Octo and Octo is a fantastic fantastic product, um, you know it's 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 built for the cloud it's built for cloud management. It's built for multi. It's built for multi vendors, which is a problem with Azure, a bigger and bigger problem with with Azure AD. And uh, you know, so it's independent of technology. You're not stuck in the Microsoft stack for the rest of your world. And you can look at look at the share of Microsoft, Microsoft uh, share of Microsoft um, uh, technology dollar spend on SMBs as a percentage is going down and down and down. It's still got its core products and core technologies like Windows 10 and. Office 365 and you know the fantastic products, but but there are lots of other lots of other vendors out there. So so uh, we're so we're really following the path. Of, you can use Azure, but you can use Okta a lot better. It's uh, it's got much much more advanced uh, capabilities and and uh, and so we built a whole layer around that, and we built a product that allowed you know Okta, which is being which is being acquired by all the major Fortune 500 companies are are using Okta now. To manage their identity, uh, so we're using exactly the same technology, but we've completely built a complete MSP layer around that, so that the MSP is operating in a comfortable set of tools that are multi-tenant and allow them to do all the things that they want to do with the uh, with the technology. So the on-premise technology still sits there. People still need their RMMs. Uh, they're still managing those devices. They've, they're getting good money every month for doing that. Now we're saying add to those monthly 
no monthly bills, add, add identity management into your monthly into your monthly fee. You're charging you know sixty dollars a month per user, or whatever for for all your services. That includes all your RMM monitoring, all the stuff. Now I put identity management in there as well for another you know, 10, 15, $20 a month for fully managed identity management. And now you've blocked ransomware, you've ended uh, password chaos, you've got single authentication across all your, uh, all your technologies. So that's, that's, that's the difference between what we're doing and what, uh, and what, our, uh, and what uh, local technology that manages on-premise is doing. So your your company uh, is is uh, zero tech, obviously. So, so I mean, for for somebody in the audience who is thinking, okay, Azure AD, you know, is inadequate in in certain ways for me as an MSP, but I'm I've got everything set up there, you know, for for all of my uh, clients already right now. I'm not sure that I want to uh, um, undo or or give up all the the work that I put into um, creating, you know. Uh, uh, all these uh, Azure Directory uh, records and, and so on and so forth. To, to what extent or, or how does Zero Tech um, incorporate or integrate with um, existing IAM deployments, that, including Azure AD that people might have out there? Oh, absolutely. There are authentications all over the place. And so the idea of, of, uh, of, of Zero Tech is to, uh, is to have the single point of authentication. So that, so you, you know, Azure AD is, is uh, is great and it comes you know free at the level one with uh, with um, with Office three sixty five license so that's great so we lever leverage that completely and we federate just federate into uh, into Office three sixty five and now you're into the whole off uh, the whole uh, uh, Microsoft world but you also are federating into Google so all your Google customers are are incorporated into the same model and and all the technology you have is is all is all uh, authenticated through through a single point of authentication which allows you to access all of those with uh, without being locked into any of them and uh, but also giving you the ability to to not have to have different you know when you want to sign into Google then you're going through some other path or some other applications that aren't supported by by, by Azure or others, so uh, Azure AD, I should say, or others. So, Jameson, I want to bring you into the conversation now because I, you, for years, you have been somebody I have kind of turned to. You're, you're a, a leading edge cloud thinker in my, uh, you know, constellation of, of acquaintances and so on. And I've, I've asked you, I've spoken with you on numerous occasions. I mean, you know, how is it different for an MSP if they're really getting serious about the cloud, et cetera? And every time we've ever spoken about that, you've always begun by talking about in essence, the IAM issue and, and, and Azure AD and the differences between the Active Directory that people are sort of used to. So I know that you too feel that that is sort of a foundational issue uh, around cloud computing. And so I'm just curious to kind of get your, your perspective on, on some of what Peter is talking about here about the, the difficulties or the complexities uh, of that and, and what it is that MSPs need um, in order to fix that problem. Yeah, so... First of all, yeah, Peter is uh, you know preaching to the choir with me on this whole conversation. Um, I remember, I think Peter, you and I met on a bus on the way to like an IT Nation party years and years and years ago, and we just struck up this conversation and realized really quickly that uh, we were so highly aligned in this conversation. I've been uh, doing a lot of speaking, mostly around like ConnectWise and Chartech and all these others uh, around kind of like the future of cloud what's coming in, in the SaaS, why MSPs and their current premise model are broken. Um, I talked a lot about what Peter just mentioned that how I, I'd ask a crowd of, you know, 500 people, like how many of you think that one of your clients calls and says this employee's left and your tier one tech uh, turns off their account and they've been shut out of everything in your company and they don't have any access to any SaaS apps or anything else and not a single hand will raise. Everybody's like, oh God. This is like, we know this is a growing problem. Uh, the other one is we've seen a lot of people who service verticals who are letting uh, SaaS vendors kind of come in and steal the initial identity login to their, it's like, they, it's like, the, it's like this is my path to my system in the cloud is through this vertical vendor. Um, and I kind of coined this thing where I was like, he who owns the identity wins. He who owns the identity wins. And in my MSP, seven years ago, 
we stopped selling endpoints and we dropped our RMM tools. They were irrelevant to me. It, it was it had nothing to do with anything. Uh, the future was my stuff's in the cloud. How do I get to it? Get to it? How do I have single SSO and two FA and protect it? Um, and after that conversation with Peter, we actually we've connected multiple times since then to talk about this. Been really interested in what Zero Tech's doing. Um, oh, in a pure Microsoft world, I could skirt around what I could do with Azure AD, but um, in my first software venture after I sold my MSP, um, co-founded a company called Tmatics, and our first client was like, if you don't integrate to Okta, we aren't gonna bring you into the equation. So I, what was really interesting is I sat down with their CTO and had a kind of a deeper conversation on their thinking. They were a larger consulting company that did a lot of different kinds of work, but they got very much into cloud consulting and Microsoft consulting as well. And their premise was with 700 plus employees, everything's in the cloud. And if we don't, if it doesn't integrate and start with Okta, we're not going to implement it. And I, that's the future. I immediately, I already believed this, but to see a mid-market company out there proving it four years ago, um, this was such an inevitability. So I, I even aligned with this 2025 thinking, Peter, saying that like, where are we headed? How has COVID changed, forced the issue of all these people have things in brick and mortar between their four walls? And they're like, now they're work from home. They're thinking about security, everything SaaS apps. How do you as an MSP manage that? And, how, and I, I'm still kind of shocked, like Peter said, like, how are these RMM tools proliferating and growing <laughs> when I, I don't care? I get in a browser, get to your you know protected VM and have the SSO. And, and I need to be able to singularly like handle my clients onboard, offboard, provision, deprovision, and authenticate across my client base. So um, it's really interesting. I really wish that these kinds of we were trying to figure this out. I mean, we were, you, Rich, you know this. I was, I was BPOS all in, you know, 30 clients on BPOS before they even had the Office 365 wasn't even a moniker. So a little bit too early to the party. And we were having to figure out some stuff. Um, Microsoft was, you know, they were flying the plane, but it, they didn't have, they barely finished their wings. It was, it was pretty bad. It was clunky. Um, Azure AD didn't replace premise space AD. Those, and I think there's still a lot of MSPs who've attempted and worked in these models. And because they may have started early like me, they didn't, they stopped and they, they haven't completely committed or believed in what the future is going to look like. And, and, and I, I thought we'd be further than where we are now five years ago. But man, 2020 has kind of been the gauntlet that's forced a lot of people into the, in the right way of thinking. Yeah, you know, and I'll, I'll ask this of you, uh, Peter, and you know, maybe you can chime in as well, uh, Jameson, because you, you were talking, you know, before about how COVID has sort of forced the issue and work from home and uh, the the rapid, enormous um, migration into SaaS and and into the cloud. I, I know when we first started talking about this, Jameson, it, you were very much trying to persuade people that they needed to be thinking about this issue. Um, but I'm wondering, Peter, I mean, do, do you? Do you have MSPs coming to you now and saying, this has become a pain point for me, I need help with it? Or are you trying to help them understand, um, you know, what the problem is that you're trying to tackle? Yeah, it's it's really changing. I, I actually had two days ago, a small MSP in Reno said, just came in our website and they left me this note and I thought I'd actually read it to you. And so it's a little, just a little left on our web form. He says, well, well, don't you guys just seem like the next big thing? The amount of identity chaos is maddening. And if you can do what you say, that's very compelling. That's a, that's a five person MSP, you know? So, uh, so this is not just big companies. This is available for small companies with small customers. A lot of the small MSPs are putting this across all their you know, all, all their, uh, all, all their small customers. So it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it's James, do, you, do you as well kind of find at this point that um, it, instead of uh, MSPs ne needing to kind of understand why they need to, you know, be preparing for cloud IAM, are, are they like looking now in your experience? Yeah, are they so it's been interesting. So at ConnectStrat, um, you know, we have, we have like six strategic close coaches globally right now, really helping clients with vision, strategy, execution. 
and focused on this and that the conversation is changing from how are we trying to find and be unique a couple, like a year or two ago how are we unique from our competitors in the space to strategically how are we going to differentiate two or three years from now and what used to be like I needed to consult or convince them or teach them where this was headed. Like now are the leadership teams we work with are very, very clear cloud security, SaaS, cloud, cloud SaaS, virtual, whatever it is, and security. It's the two conversations that are predominantly, and, and one has a lot to do with the other, <laughs> right? Because if you can do identity management right with the, you know, everything that's happening right now from a breach perspective, had, you can kind of go back to 2FA and eradicate the vast majority of it. And I, when I have a sprawl of SaaS apps, I don't have 2FA on those SaaS apps uh, and I don't have SSO or identity management, then I'm just rife with, I'm a sieve for hackers at getting into my data. And, and I think people understand this and it's one thing to protect your own house as an MSP and people are getting through that and they're figuring out how to do it in their own house. But think about an MSP that has a hundred clients who each have 30 SaaS apps. Like, holy crap, that's 3000 and, and, and then multiply that times the number of employees they have. So all of a sudden in the math, you're like, I have to authenticate, you know, it's, it's like 30,000 that you know, I'm just trying to do the math quickly in my head. That's, that's nuts. Right. And you have to have a solution that scales, that's multi-tenant to do it. This is where I, I, I had, I've had multiple conversations uh, with folks around how they're trying to do this, how they're trying to figure it out. Okta, and where I was really intrigued talking to Peter about this, I remember a year or two ago, we were chatting about when he was getting this just off the ground was Okta to me was kind of like, like this is really, this is really cool stuff. A lot of people are trying to figure out what people, but they didn't have, a pricing model or a multi-tenant model that really spoke to me as an MSP, which is literally, I think, Peter, if I could say it, is this right? I mean, as, uh, so we, we go work with this 900 person consultancy in Seattle and, and they are more enterprise mid-market and Okta is a, it's a direct choice that they're making and it's really clean and really clear. And it was a beautiful, savvy solution but there was just no way I could think as an MSP how I could possibly engage with them to get it done, which is exactly the problem I saw Peter solving. Yeah. And I got pretty excited about it. So, you know, on um, a security perspective, uh, oh, go ahead, Peter, go, go, ahead. go ahead, Peter. Oh, no, I was just going to say that uh, just to follow on that story, we, 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 uh, Oct is not interested in MSPs and some of the MSPs say, you know, what, I want to work with somebody who's interested in me. They say, well, it's not Okta. They're not interested in you. They're going after Fortune 500 and they're fighting, you know, they're fighting, they're fighting Microsoft, you know, and yeah, so that's what they're doing. So we said, look, we'll do it. We, I, we think we know what MSPs need and we know what the pricing is. We know it's all, and by the way, nothing that you're doing is of any interest to MSPs. So we have to come up with something totally different. And there's, there's a, you know, we talk like if you think about the preponderance of what MSPs are trying to provide to small business, a lot of them think about what they're trying to do, why they're trying to do. It's about bringing enterprise solutions down to small business. Absolutely, that's, exact, that's that's like the whole point. It's literally what Peter is doing for MSPs is bringing an enterprise solution down to a small provider. Um, this is it. This isn't easy. This isn't easy work. And and the. This is the biggest shift. I mean, this shift from premise-based servers to SaaS apps, there's going to be a lot of MSPs that just flat out never figured out or don't even believe in it. I'm still, I still run into, I, I, I'm still shocked by even at Connection, we pick up clients who predominantly 95% of their business is taking care of on-premise servers and on-premise applications and are not even thinking about cloud. So we still run into a couple of clients who have the majority of their clients on Exchange Server and my head spins. <laughs> Um, this is not the future, right? Now, and, and, and Rich will kind of laugh because I said, he probably heard me say seven years ago, that three years ago, none of you will have an exchange server. So obviously I was too far ahead of the curve, <laughs> but it will come, it will come true. I'll just be, I was a little ahead. But <laughs> Um, and, and yeah, it's not just you, uh, by the way. I mean, I, 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 I won't tell stories, but I can remember going to conferences uh, like 10 plus years ago where, where people were saying, you've sold your last server and get used to, you know, it, it took a while, but we are, we are getting there. So um, 
So I, I have been saying for probably the last four to six months or so that, that I really think um, cloud management generally is the, the, the story of 2021. Um, and, you know, ZeroTech, you launched ZeroTech uh, last year, uh, Peter. I keep coming across other companies that either were launched last year or are just new to me and, and their startup uh, in, in the startup mode still. So really this, this whole realm of cloud management and identity and access uh, management and security, the, the whole thing is really kind of in its infancy still right now. So as you look down the road, um, uh, Peter, I mean, what, what are the things that need to happen next? You, you're, you're solving problem number one, um, but what are the other problems that are gonna need to be solved over the course of the next you know, two, three, four years before we really have a mature cloud management and security landscape out there? Well, the, the, it, is, it is really problem number one. We started our, trying to figure out problem number three when we started, and I see some, uh, some others doing that as well, which is trying to manage this SaaS sprawl and, you know, and that's that actually, you know, and we started talking to lots of MSPs and after talking to 20, 30 MSPs who all said, I don't have any interest in that. Uh, we started to think about how we, do, and, and our own thinking about how we had to deliver it, we realized the problem was foundational. You know, if you don't have the, if you don't ha know who all your users are, what assets they have access to and are able to just gather that data that you can guarantee that their policies haven't been changed or you can, have the MSP can go and look at that. You can do, you know, this kind of alerting and monitoring kind of thing going on and provisioning. So you're provisioning according to policy driven provisioning and so on and deprovisioning. So all of that stuff is, is the nuts and bolts of, of how you're going to do this. Then you can start to really worry about things like license counts. So we're doing things with Office 365, for example. So we're deeply, deeply managing all of that. And and uh, we, you know, we can do onboarding and offboarding uh, that's better than any, any, anybody else's. We're using Octus and we're leveraging our own, our own tools as well. But the fact is we can deliver superior management of Office 365 um, you know, through, you know, through, these, um, th through these tools. So the question then becomes, okay, well, what are, what are the next issues that we have with Office 365? Just look, look at that. I mean, you can, you can say, well, you know, there are still, there's still issues in, in mainly right now in, you know, in people trying to keep track of their licenses. There's been a lot of work done on that. We just, when you've got the identity management, you just know all of that all, already. You know all the licenses that are being used because you're collecting it as a byproduct of, of the whole process, as opposed to going in and trying to figure out how many licenses are, should be renewed this month or next month. So it's really foundational. And I think these things will all converge over the next, uh, over the next, uh, next few years so. Jameson what uh, what are your thoughts on that what 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 comes next once we start you know solving some of these uh, these early critical uh, problems well I, you know it's so I, I think that the problem part of the problem is when I when I was starting to move away from RMM tools I really had two issues when I was looking at cloud management tools back in the day and I was using a product uh, for a while from ConnectWise, I can't, it's called Cloud Console or something like that. And, and it was it was well done in the sense that there I had two major issues and they were trying to tackle both of them. I had to understand licensing and billing, which Microsoft doesn't make easy, right? And then I was trying to tackle kind of support and management on the other side, which I, which multi-tenant through Azure didn't make easy. So I agree with Peter that like, collapsing all of this into one place as a single management. It's, it's a problem that I see every PSA company, every RMM company, plus a lot of third-party providers all trying to solve at the same time right now. Ultimately, <clears throat> I think that the, I think that uh, the idea of configuring, you know, from a secure, from a security centralized point of identity manage, management, being able to create profiles and policies that automatically provision and deprovision users is the future of this. And no, I have yet to talk to an MSP that reliably does that well. Yeah. I bring on somebody, I set up with a, so imagine this, right, Rich? I, I set up uh, I, a new client, I onboard them. They have 50 staff. I categorize their users into one of three ways, department or whatever, there's three types of users. And when they add a new employee, 
I click a button and it provisions their four SaaS apps, their identity management. And when they leave, I go right back to that same single point of failure and I deprovision them. If I make a change to an application, everybody who's part of that profile automatically sees those changes. We couldn't do that with premise-based solutions. This just didn't exist. There's no such thing, right? And, and the fact is, is too many, too many IT providers who've been around, have been used to premise or trying to make this transition, they don't really understand. I believe there's a significant number of them that don't really understand the difference between this isn't about moving a server to the cloud and doing it the old way, right? It's this is, we've literally opened up a completely new perspective way of working with applications in the, the provisioning and deprovisioning of things can look completely different than how it used to look. And I think the future is that I'm going to be able to model what it needs to look like for a certain point. And I can scale that across clients or within clients in a way that makes my life as an IT service provider vastly easier. I can either get more price competitive or I can drive more value. I can increase margins. Um, it, I just need to be able to scale maturely. And, and right now, this is all manual acts. Um, or too manual. And, 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 and the automation that comes behind this is incredible. So one thing I want to ask Peter, because you guys have both touched on it and, and maybe I think I, I kind of understand what you guys are saying, but there might be people out there who are kind of stuck in the old ways of, of the RMM. Does endpoint management matter in the future based on what you see here? Or is it really all about identity management? How it seems like you can't just leave the endpoints un, unmonitored, right? Yeah, let me, uh, yeah, absolutely. So the endpoints are, are, are critical and they have to be tied in and they're a fundamental part of the identity process that uh, that happens. So, you know, so that, that's, that's, that's fundamentally, so you're looking at, looking at, at the device and what's going on. So if you look at in Okta, for example, they have a, they, they have a, a something called FastPass, which is just coming out in a couple of months now, but the way, the way it works is you just uh, log in and it'll be in our product as well, of course. So you just authenticate yourself on your device. So whether it's iOS or Android or Windows 10 or Mac. So you authenticate on the device and then you're into your device and, uh, and there are all your applications that you're allowed to see. And so behind the scenes, they've, they've, they've uh, looked at the policies that you wanted to have about the, the devices, locations, geofencing, all that kind of thing. They're, they're looking at all the characteristics that you've established policies for and say, okay, do we need to ask this person now to provide a, some kind of additional authentication? What factor are we going to use? Are we, you know, we're going to use an Okta Verify or some, you know, whatever it is, if we're going to do some kind of check or just some kind of multi-factor authentication. But most of the time you don't need that because you're just coming in your office, you're using, or you're, yeah, and you're, work, you're working on the same device. They see, us, oh, it's the same device, same guy, everything's fine. And no, there's nothing suspicious about this. Go right into your applications or, it's this is some, there's something different about this. Therefore, let's let's just do a little check on this and and ask a, you know and ask for a factor. And this is what you're what you're going to. This is how it, this is the future. So it's basically passwordless. There will are no more passwords. You go into your device. Your device is the core authenticate authenticator with a fingerprint or a you know face mapping or whatever you're doing. And then and then you're off and you're into your application. So but behind the scenes, there's a lot of magic going from from the time that somebody, uh, they get a fingerprint to the time that you're getting, that you're logging into your email on Office 365. But it all happens, you know, very, very quickly. And that's that's the future and that's the future is, is now. Like that is the way everybody's gonna be doing it next year. So what, you know, it's, it's moving very, very quickly. So I look at people saying, well, we need single sign-on, we need multi-factor authentication. We say, well, do you really need all of that? What, what do you, what do you actually, what is actually your problem? What are you trying to solve? And uh, yeah, and, and those are all elements of it, but I think we've, the world has moved up from thinking about, uh, you know, single sign-on, multi-factor authentication as separate things. And they're thinking of this now identity. Identity is a much bigger problem. It is, is this the person that they say they are? And how do we know that? And it, and it's, it comes from not just all, knowing those factors, but being able to gather a lot of data about who that person is, where they've just been, where they are now, you know, and are they the, the right person? And that's just gonna get more and more sophisticated 
and that's where the world is going. And, that, and so all of that single sign-on multi-factor authentication stuff is, is going to still there, but it, as a technology, but it's going to disappear behind the, behind the, behind the curtains kind of thing. Yeah. And I'd also say, Matt, to, in part of our response, it's like, I've asked, <clears throat> I have asked odd crowds, like how, how many of you, 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 you frame the question, how many of you feel like you're protecting all of your clients' data, devices that their data sits on and you get all, all the hands go up, right? That's what they think they're doing. And then I just show them my cell phone and say, how many of you feel like, how many of you do a great job, uh, you know, managing mobile MDM, mobile device management, like actually managing that device and no, maybe one hand goes up, maybe, maybe. And I go, and for the rest of you, how many of you think that none of your clients have one bit of corporate data anywhere on their mobile device, no hands go up. And, and then I go back and I ask them the first question and nobody raises their hand, right? And, and the answer is, I, and so I agree 100% with Peter, Yes, you have to think about the devices, but not in the traditional sense of an RMM tool. I'm not going to put an R. I don't think the future is me putting an RMM tool as an MSP on your iPhone. That's not the answer. The answer is the solutions or whatever they're authenticating into are going to look at that device and say, is it the right person? And is it not passing me things that are ugly and that are going to be harmful to the day? The rest of it, like when I, when I went into this world, I was using you know, some elements of what Microsoft provided from the cloud. But the day we really kind of made that pivot as an MSP to cloud-based computing, we stopped selling endpoints and we stopped using RMM solutions. And we relied on identity management to protect everything was in the cloud. I don't, I want you to be able to do the same thing from a kiosk in the airport where I am never going to be able to put an, R, an RMM product on a kiosk in an airport. But I need you to be able to do the same thing from that browser that you can do from your phone personal laptop or your desktop at work. It shouldn't matter where you are or what device you're using. So the, it's, it's, you have to reframe what, uh, what, what that looks like. Like it, it has to happen from the, from the cloud, not from the device, right? Peter, I, I can imagine, and probably Jameson, you as well, you guys must go through an enormous amount of Excedrin because when you really start to think about what has to happen behind the scenes, to make all that work seamlessly, it has got to give you a headache, <laughs> right? So, um, so Jameson, one other one other question that uh, I wanted to come back to was your. So, th there's going to be a lot of competition in this space right now. Is one of your competitive um, approaches to when you're when you're working with competitors is to set up your office across the street for them so you can like mess with them from across the street? So, if you get a competitor, are you going <laughs> to yeah. do that? Great. Yeah, you probably will be able to. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm actually quite thankful that I, I don't own an MSP any longer. It's, uh, it's something I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> and then I get to coach other people who are thinking about these things. Um, but, you know, I, it, you're kind of getting into the, like, what is the threat profile for MSPs today, right? I mean, it's, and, you know, it, it's been, it's been an interesting year. It has been an interesting year. The attacks have been prolific. They've been different than what we've seen in the past in, in terms of, of what attacks look like on, on MSPs. And uh, I think that's an interesting, yeah. a lot, I mean, security, the, the, the middle part of 2020 with like three or four really bad publicized MSP attacks. Uh, boy, I, our strategic conversations with our clients and the leadership teams of the MSPs we were working with, they shifted very, very quickly. Uh, I think people had their head in the sand for a long time. And, and the exposure is different because they're thinking about, they traditionally have thought about antivirus products, firewalls, protect our servers, protect our network. And all of a sudden they're like, that's not where any of this came from. Um, and people were, it, it, was a, it was an awakening year for a lot of people. Yeah, Peter, you gonna you gonna um, look for your competitors and set up offices across the street so you can wave at them like you, like in the enable days. I think uh, well we're in the we're in we're in the we, uh, I'll tell you it does feel like uh, 2004 uh, <laughs> right now you know uh, kind of a repeat because there aren't really you know the competitors are pretty disorganized the description of the problem is not clear for everybody. Uh, so there's a lot of education to go on and we're going to be, able to be building out that part of it. Uh, you know, there's a lot, it's, it is so reminiscent of those early days. 
but it's going to be one of those things that just catches on. If you look at the RMM business, it went from 2004 to from, at nothing to 2009, five years later, every MSP had to have it. So five years, there was went from zero adoption to, to total adoption, not, obviously not completely, but it was been massive. And, and so we're going to be getting into that space, into that space very, very soon. So uh, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see who's there, you know, I'm, uh, we're not too worried about anybody, but we're worried about everybody, you know, so it's one of those things where there's nobody re who's really, who's really raised their hand and, uh, and everybody, and I like, I love it. It's very similar because everybody has their own approach. We think our approach is the best. We think it's unique. We think MSPs can make a lot of money. We think they can adopt this very quickly. I mean, you see the money, and Jameson mentioned that. If, you, if you've got some, uh, an MSP with 5,000 users, and each one of those people, you're not collecting an additional, you know, even $10 a month, even $10 a month for those 10,000 customers, you should pick up $100,000 a month of, of new, brand new profitable revenue a month coming in. So just do the math and start to figure this out, you know, and your customer needs it. They're happy because... They don't have any more of the chaos that they've got. You've re you've reduced the big the biggest threat they've got, which is which is protecting against against a ransomware attack through identity theft. So you solved his biggest problem. You've, you're going to put at least ten dollars a month per user per month profit into your pocket. So that's a lot of money. And so we've got small MSPs, what one or two people who've got maybe. Three four hundred devices under management, and um, they say, "Look, I, I need to make this simple. So we just want to have this for all our customers. Period, uh, and that's it. And then now we can manage all our customers because if we don't have it, we can't manage our customers. We have no idea what they're doing. We don't know what they're using or what they're. We, we can't control their security, and we're not asking them. This isn't an option for them. This is something we're just going to say. You know, you were paying sixty dollars a month. Now you're paying." $75 a month, and this is what you're getting for it. And you have to have this because I can't responsibly serve you if you don't have your identity management under control and all your applications under control. And we can do this for you or you can stop being our customer because we're, we don't want that risk. As this insurance for the MSP, it's insurance for the customer, it's an easy sale, but people don't have their mind around all this yet. So this is why it's an interesting discussion we're having now because I think we're just in the next, you know, 2021, we're going to go from this being a, kind of a, a, an early discussion and we're going to look back, I think, a year from now and say, hmm, I think a lot of people are starting to get this and starting to roll it out. And we're, you know, again, we have, you know, people coming in. We haven't done any marketing yet. We're just starting to starting to roll that out and, and things are, uh, are looking great. Definitely. It's definitely something we're going to be talking about uh, a lot this year and probably next. And I, I definitely think that the writing is on the wall. And they're going to get a lot of interest. So, Peter, uh, we're going to we're going to stop there. Um, I want to thank you for coming on and talking with us today. It was a, a fascinating discussion. Uh, for those who want to who are like are like, yes, that is exactly my pain point. That is exactly what I need. Where can they learn about uh, Zero Tech and how can they find out more? Well, they can find out more just at our website, zerotech.com, and uh, leave us a note there, and we'll be sure to follow up. Fantastic. We'll put that link uh, in our show notes page. So with that, uh, I want to say a big, big thank you again to Peter Sanford, uh, CEO of Zero Tech for uh, stopping in. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, uh, we'll wrap up the rest of the show um, with uh, possibly a museum pick, but uh, definitely a tech pick. And Rich will look into his crystal ball and tell us what has been and what might be coming in the future. Stick around for that. We'll be right back. <music> And we are back with part three of this episode of Channel 4 Weekly. So, Rich, um, Jameson, fascinating discussion. What a great interview. Um, uh, it, really, it really changes what, the way you think about what the real issues are, not only from a security perspective, but just from a, the, from a workflow perspective that people are dealing with and how identity management is really a critical, critical thing to fix. Um, Rich, what were some of your takeaways from that? 
Well, I, you know, it, I guess one of the things that uh, I, I didn't get a chance to to ask about, um, uh, and, and and you know, maybe Peter would have been the wrong guy to ask, you know, given that he's a, a competitor potentially. But I do think about you know, it, there was a lot of talk about how um, legacy RMM systems are less and re less relevant, uh, let's say, uh, than they were before. And uh, I, I mean, just to to take an example that pops into my head, I know late last year, Data was saying. That they're going to increase their R and D budget around cloud uh, management forty percent this year. Like they they kind of understand there's a transition happening that they really need to get on top of, or they could get left behind. But one thing that I was kind of thinking about listening to James and listening to Peter is just how well are the ConnectWise's and and SolarWinds MS you know P or enables and and uh, Datos of the world going to be able to make that transition? Will they be able to? do it at all and will they be able to do it fast enough to keep up um you know and i mean they there's a lot of capital for them to draw on a lot of very smart people on the payroll but i i do wonder about that a little bit yeah jameson any uh, any takeaways from that interview yeah you know i the, my takeaway we kind of related a little bit in there but you know we opened the show a little bit talking about work from home and security and predictions and all that stuff then we talk about identity management and devices and rmm and and uh, really, I think my takeaway was really around 2020 and COVID and how the acceleration of all of this. I and, mean, you know, you look at online retail and, and my friends who are in, in this world and they say the, their industries have moved forward four or five years in, in the space of six months, right? And I think that kind of the same things happening here, like we're having to tackle cloud security, identity, boom, 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 it work from home and all of it's kind of forcing us uh, to move much, much faster in short order. Uh, so so it's, it's an interesting, which frankly, uh, you know, I knew about zero tech before uh, COVID, but I think this has probably accelerated things for Peter significantly. Um, and and the, the more I've thought about it uh, since the conversation is, is like, wow, there's a, this is a really ripe time for him to be on top of this. It's going to be interesting. That it is um, kind of makes you it makes you think about the old days when when all we had the most technology we had was a fax machine and uh, and and standard telephones you know like those are the nice days and speaking of standard telephones uh, Jameson you have a very interesting museum pick up so everybody knows that we we try to do a museum pick where I pick something from my large massive collection of ancient stuff that I have that I don't know why I still have this stuff but I do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I love it when I have a guest on that I can, that I can turn it over and we can uh, explore some ancient thing that they have. And yours, I, I love not it because ancient. it's amazing how this is. It's not going to seem like it's ancient, but it is. What is it? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny because I probably have other things I could contribute that are ancient. So I've got like a and it's a you know, it's a Polycom VoIP phone. Like it's a phone. It's current. And like you could still buy these. Uh, but it went directly into my museum. Um, I think it sat on my desk. You know, I could connect it with Microsoft Teams. I did it, did that. Um, and then I was like, but I have a speakerphone and Teams on my computer. And at what point do I actually feel it never happened? Am I going to pick this up and put it? Why? Anyway, I, it was just, I mean, it was literally straight from production line to my shop online shopping cart to landing on my desk to my shelf and it was uh, and and what's crazy is like yeah it's all VoIP it's the way we're all doing it these days and I, I don't know about you guys I don't have a landline in my house anymore even with kids we're all done everybody's on their cell phone but the world's different and voice isn't what it used to be and even you know it, it it's it's interesting that they use basically an antiquated device for current technology and in reality, I've got my little Sennheiser speakerphone and my webcam, and I'm good for everything. Um, it's 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 interesting. That's why I love your museum pick because it really makes you think about how even just in the last year, how communication has changed, right? Like before, getting people to go on a webcam and do a video conference was it was difficult. Like a lot of people didn't want to communicate that way, but now it's like that's kind of the way everybody's used to communicating. And not a lot of people like the 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 standard telephone rings. We can also thank spammers for ruining the standard telephone. Because like yeah. I I do I actually do still have a landline here. I don't know why, but I I still <laughs> I pay I pay like practically nothing for it. But like every time it rings, 
I just know it's it's a spammer, right? Like I, we never answer it. I loathe actually putting that thing to my head. That's why Literally I love why your we got rid of it. I think one day we asked ourselves, when's the last time picked, somebody picked this up and it was a person we wanted to talk to on the other end? When we realized it had been two months, I was like, I just think I unplugged it from the wall. <laughs> right, like we're done. Yeah, you're done with it. And is this- cell phones is coming, it, 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 like even on the mobile phone, it's kind of that way too. Like I don't answer the phone. Unless I know who it is, like, but if it's a number I don't recognize, I never answer it because I, yeah, because I'd I, and I'd much prefer text or a video call if, if it's with someone who I know, you know. So it's just amazing how phone just tele, telephony in, in general has just died in the last two years. Fast, yeah. <laughs> so crazy stuff. So I love it. So we're gonna make that uh, the uh, Jameson West's museum pick, the Polycom. VoIP phone, and we'll also make it the tech pick because there are people who still work at desks and absolutely love their phone and you can go and buy that thing like brand new right now. So that's our tech pick as well, the Polycom uh, VoIP phone. Go get one and uh, put it on your shelf to stare at and hope it doesn't (laughs) ring. (laughs) So uh, good stuff there. All right, Rich, um, I liked that quite a bit. Why don't you, if you can, take a few minutes to tell us what uh, we might have missed in this week's, in case you missed it, and what might be coming in the weeks ahead. Yes, indeed. So uh, in, in case you missed it, uh, in case you're not familiar with it, is our uh, weekly look at news from the week that was that may have swept your attention. It's written by our own James Gaskin. This week he's going to be talking about uh, some facial recognition software that uh, Intel announced this week. Um, we didn't get a chance to report on it a whole lot uh, on Channel Pro this week, but uh, it was a, a big week for uh, for Pax8. We've been talking about cloud computing, Pax8, the cloud distributor. Um, they raised $96 million of private equity capital. They they made an acquisition. They promoted a bunch of people uh, inside the company. They're, they're really starting to, to think globally now. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, big year in 2020 for them, and um, they're going bigger in, uh, in 2021. Uh, uh, some new projectors from Epson, uh, James will be telling you about, and he'll also have a few words for you about uh, a guy who had a, a little too much to drink maybe over the holidays and woke up in the morning to realize that he had legally changed his name to Celine Dion. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into that with you uh, in, in case you missed it. Coming up, as we alluded to before, um, CES, formerly known as the Consumer Electronics Show, which means all of the big hardware companies are going to have lots and lots of new announcements. Um, We will be covering a lot of that for you. Once again, as I I said before, Stephanie Halford from Intel will be back on to talk about some of that. Uh, And also Citrix is doing their uh, annual Citrix Summit next next week. So we'll be getting some uh, some news out of them. Cannot wait for it, everybody, to point your web browsers to channelpronetwork.com where you can get all of that, plus news, articles, downloads, white papers, uh, podcasts, anything and everything that you can think of to make your business better and help you make more money and stay on top of things. Uh, Big thanks to Jameson West for joining us uh, again here as a guest host on this show. Uh, We we know that our our guest hosts, they make a a commitment to come and do our show because it's a little bit longer, uh, but we love it. We hope that they had fun. Jameson, did you have fun? I had a blast. I really appreciate you guys having me on again. I would, I sincerely hope to do it again sometime. It's really fun. I, I enjoy it and learn a lot every time. Thank you. Abs- absolutely. And, and Jameson, if anybody wants to connect with you, uh, learn more about you or any of your companies, where can they go? How can they do that? I'm, I'm all over LinkedIn, Facebook, all that stuff. And with a name like Jameson, pretty easy to find. Um, but Jameson, J-A-M-I-S-O-N at connectstrat.com is probably the easiest way to find me. Uh, pretty I'm all over the place, though. I've got, I don't know, like six email addresses. Just email Jameson at something. I'll probably get it. <laughs> awesome. And you do have your own website. I happened to run across that one when I was doing some research on you. It's jamesonwest.com. Yeah, just kind of, uh, I had a, it goes back to that problem you asked me about earlier. Like, who am I? I don't know. At some point, it all collides. It, I guess I'm me, uh, regardless of the company I'm representing. So jamesonwest.com is the easy, easy one. <laughs> never change your name because you'll never get your own .com. Oh, that, never, yeah, no, it won't be Celine Dion. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be Celine Dion. Yeah, I got to read that story. That's that's funny stuff. Uh, yeah, good stuff. Um, so, of course, if you want to follow Channel 4 Network as well, uh, we're all over the, the LinkedIn, Channel 4 Network on LinkedIn and Facebook, at, S- at Channel 4 SMB on Twitter. Jameson, you on the Twitters? You have a Twitter handle? I do. Jameson West. Shocking. Ve- that's a good uh, one. Very shocking. Mine is at, at Matt Whitlock. Go figure. Rich, what are you? At Rich Free. 
So follow us all there. And again, shelfornetwork.com's website. Please subscribe to the Shelfor Weekly Podcast. We are everywhere podcasts can be found. Uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. We're on Audible now and Amazon Music, just wherever it is. But subscribe, make it easy. That way you can take Channel Pro Weekly with you wherever you go and be instantly notified when there's new, new uh, episodes. If you do like to watch, we are on YouTube. You can watch... Uh, Watch there, subscribe, hit the, the red subscribe button, and then hit the bell for notifications and join us there. Leave a comment or two. We always like that. Podcast at channelpronetwork.com is the email address. We love to get emails, so send it to us. We don't like phone calls, apparently, though, so do not <laughs> telephone us, but uh, definitely send the email. And we'll check those out. Uh, big thanks again to Jameson West. A big thanks also to Peter Sandiford uh, from Zero Tech for joining us as well. And we will see you all in episode 172, the ces -athon. Uh, we, uh, it'll be a lot of fun. We'll see you all then. Take care.